Hello everyone, Mr. Fawcett here, and we are back with a brand new unit of geometry. Uh, this is also one of my favorite units because this is where we really set the foundation for you all to be able to make a really strong sound logical argument for the math that you're putting on paper. Um, it's where we it's where we're going to be challenged to think in ways that we probably haven't been challenged to think before. Um, and it's gonna it's it's gonna get a little tough at first or it's gonna seem tough, but uh, my goal is that you eventually learn to like this way of thinking, uh, that you learn to like the challenge of proving uh, statements that you make um, in any class, but specifically math class at the moment. So let's get started. I'm excited and I hope you at least are excited by the end of this unit, if not at the at the uh, present time. So this lesson is called inductive, inductive Reasoning and Conjectures. We'll get into more about what those words mean in a second. First thing I want you to do, uh, like always, uh, take some time to do some review. So you have problems one through four, pause the video, uh, answer them on your own, and then come back and see how you did. Okay, so number one says blank points are points that lie on the same line. So we should say collinear here. Starting off a new unit with poor penmanship. Collinear. Number two says blank points are points that lie in the same plane. So instead of linear, because we're not talking about a line, we're going to say coplanar. Coplanar. Spelled with an A, not an E. Number three says the sum of the measures of two blank angles is 90 degrees. So this goes back to last unit. Uh, complementary angles should sum to 90 degrees. Complementary. Number four, blank angles share a vertex and one side. This would be adjacent. These angles always share a vertex and one side. There are some other angles that uh, sometimes share a vertex and one side, like sometimes complementary angles share a vertex and one side, uh, sometimes supplementary angles share a vertex and one side, but adjacent angles always share a vertex and one side. All right, let's get into uh, the new concepts for this unit. So you have three scenarios to read through, and I'm going to have you read these on your own. Uh, then we're going to talk about them. You have three scenarios, and then you have a question down here that says, what is similar about all three scenarios? So there's no wrong answers here. Uh, you're just brainstorming. I mean, I guess there's some wrong answers if you write down something that's irrelevant to the question, but uh, don't be afraid to put down an answer because you don't think it may be right, right? There's a lot of different things we could think about here. Okay, so scenario one talked about uh, Darnell, his store has been broken into three times in the last month. Every time that happened, uh, the perpetrator was a male, so he concludes that all thieves are men. Uh, scenario two, uh, marine biologists are trying to figure out whether California whales migrate along the shore, which is the longer route, or if they take the most direct route to their destination. And we, they're given a chart of whales each day, uh, that take the direct route versus take the short route. And you can kind of see that, uh, or sorry, the shore route, not the short route. The direct route would be the short route. Uh, the shore route is the longer route. Try to say all those words 10 times fast. Um, and you can see that most whales are taking the shore route, which is actually the longer uh, route. In scenario three, Jennifer plays soccer, basketball, and lacrosse for Sky Point. Uh, she noticed that all her teachers were all, or all of her coaches were also teachers, so she inferred or concluded that every coach is a teacher. So it says, what is similar about all three scenarios? And they're, these are all dealing with different scenarios, right? They're, one's talking about uh, you know robberies, one's talking about whales in the ocean, and one's talking about a student. So it's not that the uh, variables are the same in each scenario. It's 
what's going on with those variables. So in each scenario, someone is trying to make a conclusion based on prior examples. So Darnell makes his conclusion based on the three instances that the store was broken into. The marine biologists are going to make their conjecture based on their observations. And Jennifer, based on her experience with her own teams, concludes that, well, if all her coaches were teachers, then every coach must be a teacher. So again, uh, if we want to put this in words, we can say that a conclusion was being made based on prior examples and or data. Okay, let's move on. Let's start to talk about specific vocab for today. Uh, so inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that a rule or statement is true because prior examples are true. So you see something happen in the past, you read about something happen in the past, you hear about something happening in the past, and then you make a conclusion about what may happen in the future based on those past examples. So here we have an example. Uh, every college that Jeremy has visited has had on-campus housing available. Thus, Jeremy infers that all colleges provide on-campus housing. Let's make that a period. Uh, is this a correct inference? Well, you could think about that yourself, whether that makes sense. But regardless about whether it's a correct inference, this is an example of inductive reasoning. Jeremy took previous examples, prior examples, and used those to make a decision about what might be true in general. A conjecture is exactly what Jeremy made, right? A conjecture is a statement that you believe to be true based on inductive reasoning. So a conjecture is like your conclusion. After you've looked at all the data, after you've seen the examples, et cetera, of uh, stuff that's happened before, then you come up with a conclusion for what you think is to be true. Uh, Jeremy's inference was that all colleges on, uh, must have on-campus housing. It's important to note that just because it's happened before, it doesn't mean it's always going to be the case. So a conjecture can turn out to be false uh, after further investigation. And sometimes it happens in math, right? We see a bunch of examples that all work out the same way and we make an assumption that we think is true. But then maybe a couple weeks later, we run across a new problem and we're like, oh, what I thought worked every time doesn't work every time. It just may work most of the time, or it may have just worked in the examples that I was given. So conjectures are what we think to be true, but they may turn out to be false after we do some more research. And we have a counterexample. Now, a counterexample is a statement, number, or drawing that proves a conjecture false. So we can think back to Jeremy's example. He thought that, or he concluded that all colleges provide on-campus housing. Well, a counterexample to his statement would be a school that doesn't have on-campus housing, right? Maybe he visit, or maybe he hears about an online school that is completely virtual, and they don't have anywhere for students to stay on campus because they don't have a campus. Well, that would be a counterexample to Jeremy's initial conjecture. All right, let's move on. So how to make a conjecture. Uh, so I give you this statement right here, and you need to kind of fill it in. It says the product of an even number and odd number is always blank. Think about what it said up above on how to make a conjecture. Right? It said a conjecture is a statement that you believe to be true based on inductive reasoning. Okay, let's go back up and reread what inductive reasoning is. Inductive reasoning is the process of reasoning that a rule or statement is true because prior examples are true. So if we're trying to fill in this conjecture, we need to come up with an example. We need to come up with more than one example, ideally, um, and then try to fill in the conjecture based off of that. So there's a couple of these. There's one on this page, and there's two more on this page. So I want you to work through all three. What you're going to do is come up with examples that will help you fill in the blank. Um, once you come up with those examples, you may notice a pattern, 
and that may give you a good word or a good number uh, to fill in that blank with. Then come back here and we'll start discussing. So some examples for number one. Uh, the product means multiplication. So I'm just going to multiply an even and an odd number. So seven times six, that gives me 42. Uh, let's do three times four, that gives me 12. Let's do, let's do 16 times 11. That's going to give me 176. And let's do one more. Let's do 25 times five. Uh, now we can do five. Let's do four. That gives me 100. So looking at all these boxed answers, what does the product seem to be? What are some answers uh, we could put? Well, they're all positive, that's true, but maybe I could come up with negative three times four. That still fits a requirements, an even and an odd uh, number, and that gives me negative 12. So positive upon further investigation doesn't seem to be the best choice, right? It doesn't, it doesn't fit. What else do we notice about those numbers? Well, we should see pretty quickly that they're all even. So while this isn't a proof, right? A proof is not showing that some examples are true. You've got to show a you've you've got to show that it works in every single scenario. And that's not what we're doing right now. We're just making a conjecture. Um, we can be somewhat confident, right? Because for all the examples we tried, um, our conjecture was true. It doesn't mean it's always true. Um, because we haven't tested every example yet, we haven't had a proof, but we have a we have a good feeling about it. Okay, number two says the sum of an even and odd number is always blank. Well, let's do some examples. So three plus four, because sum means add, that's going to be equal to seven. Uh, let's do a negative one, so I could have negative three. Uh, plus negative six, that gives me negative nine. Let's do 25 plus 10, that gives me 35. And let's do eight plus one, which is nine. So as we look at all those sums, right, we have both uh, positive and negative, but they're all odd. So that's what I'm going to fill in this conjecture with. Um, based on those examples, my educated guess would be that the sum is always going to be odd. Okay, uh, last one for this section. Number three, if a number is evenly divisible by four, then it is also evenly divisible by blank. And we can't use uh, one because every number is divisible by one. So let's pick some numbers evenly divisible by four. Evenly divisible just means we're going to get an integer as our answer. So we're not going to get a decimal. So 16 divided by four. That, Or you know what? Let's just, we don't actually have to write divisible by four. We can just write the numbers that are divisible by four. So 16 is divisible by four. 12 is divisible by four. Negative... 24 is divisible by 4, 36 is divisible by 4, 40, 4, uh, 8, and we could keep going, right, both with positive and negative numbers. What do we notice about all these numbers? Is there something else that they all have in common? Are they also divisible by some other number? Well, are they also divisible by 8? Well, some of them are, like 16 and negative 24 and 40 and 8, but not all of them. But they are also evenly divisible by 2. So that would be a conjecture based on the examples we have. Let's move on to counterexamples. To disprove a counter, to disprove a conjecture, we only need to find one counterexample. Again, because if the conjecture doesn't work for every scenario, it's false. And to prove that it doesn't work for every scenario, you just have to prove that it doesn't work for one scenario. So the last thing for this video and for this lesson is going to be you working through these examples 
and trying to find counterexamples that disprove the conjectures. So here's the conjecture. We have a conjecture for number one. It says for all positive numbers n, if you divide one by n, that's going to be less than or equal to n. You need to see if you can prove that false. See if there's a number that you could substitute in for n that makes that makes this equation, let me get my pen out, this equation false. Right? If you can, then that would be a counterexample, you've disproved it. So pause the video, see how many of those you can get done, and then come back and uh, we'll go over a couple of these. All right, so I'm just gonna check some numbers and see what happens. I'm gonna choose the number one. So one divided by one is less than or equal to one which gives us one is less than or equal to one. That checks out. Let's check two. One divided by two, less than or equal to two. Uh, well, one half is less than or equal to two, so that checks out. Uh, let's do a bigger one, let's do 50. One divided by 50 is less than or equal to 50. That is also true. Now. It looks like this conjecture is true, right? All the examples I've tried, they've worked. I can't try negative numbers uh, because it says for all positive numbers, and I also can't try zero. So are there any different types of positive numbers that I haven't tried? Well, I've only tried uh, natural numbers. I've only tried the positive integers. What if I tried a fraction? Let's see. I'm going to choose 1 half or 0.5. So 1 divided by 0.5 is less than or equal to 0.5. If we come over here, 1 divided by 0.5 is 2. So 2 is less than or equal to 0.5. Uh oh. That is false, right? Because this is false, that's our counterexample that has disproved, or now we know that this conjecture is false. Okay, it does not work for numbers less than one. Um, it's not necessarily, it, 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 you don't have to rewrite the conjecture to make it true. Like you don't have to figure out, okay, what numbers don't make it work. You just have to come up with one that doesn't make it work. So we did that. Uh, 0.5 was a number that made this false. Okay. Let's look at, you know, I'm going to skip number two. Uh, let's look real quick at the graph. So it says the temperature in Abilene, Texas never exceeds 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the spring months, which are March, April, and May. So that's a conjecture. Uh, but do we have data to show that that's false? Well, let's check the three months they're talking about, March, April, and May. March, we're good. It's less than... 100. April, we're good. It's less than 100. But, uh-oh, May is 107. So this is our counterexample. Right? So we know that this is false because it does exceed 100 degrees. It happened in May. See if we have time for one more. Um, let's do number four. So number four says, and I'm going to give us some more space here because we're going to draw some diagrams. So it says, for any three points in a plane, there are three distinct lines that can be drawn that include two of the points. So it's a little wordy, but let me draw an example of what they're saying. So if I have three points that are in a plane, then there are three distinct lines. So one, do them in different colors, two, and three. And each of those lines must have two points on each of them. And we can see that in this case, they do. So your goal would be to try to find, is there, a, is there a way for me to draw these three points so that I can't draw three different
different lines. That's what distinct means, three different lines. Well, let's see. What if I drew them like this? Well, I've got one line here. Put the arrows on to make sure we know it's a line. I've got one line here. That has two points on it. Oh, and I have another line here. So those three points didn't provide us with a counterexample. Again, hopefully you're, you're trying this before or you've tried this before you watch the video. So um, if you haven't though, pause it. Don't look at the solution until uh, you've tried this yourself and thought about it. One of the reasons scholars get frustrated with this unit and the ones that follow are because the answer may not be apparent right away. And you have to think about, you know, something from a different angle, uh, no pun intended, than you've had to think about it before. So it's okay to sit there for five minutes and not come up with anything. But sitting there for those five minutes, thinking about different examples, it's going to help you long term because it's going to get your mind to look at different possibilities for problems that are going to be beneficial down the road. Anyway, drum roll, here's the solution. If you draw three collinear points, right, there's only one line that goes between them. I can't draw, like if I draw another line, one, it's going to go through all of the points again, but two, it's going to be the same line. So it's, we're not going to have three distinct lines. We're just going to have one line that goes through all of them. Okay. We are going to stop the video there. We are just over 20 minutes. Good news is there is no part two uh, video for this lesson. Uh, so we did wrap this one up. Uh, as always, enjoy the rest of your day, and I look forward to seeing you at our next video.